Tales of Sundapple Wood by Jixi Dye. Read by Jixi Dye. This is the tale of a bunch of animals that live in a nice sunny wood, and the games they play, and the antics they get up to. Chapter 1 Mr. Croaksby and Hopeless Mr. Croaksby was a large green frog. He lived in the steep bank near the pond. Food was plentiful for him, and his work was nearby, for he worked as a boatman, ferrying other animals across the pond on his little twig raft. One morning he awoke, dressed in his beautiful blue waistcoat, and went to his job. Arriving at the boathouse, which was nothing more than an old laundry detergent box with a door cut out in it, he fished out his boat and pushed it into the water. The first people to come to the pond that morning had no need of his services, however. The Featherton sisters were certainly the loudest visitors to the pond and as they were usually followed by a string of ducklings all cheeping and skipping along after them, the noise was all the more distracting. Mr. Croaksby fell to polishing and repairing his boat. What are you doing? Mr. Croaksby turned at the voice behind him. It turned out to be a very small duckling. Repairing my boat for the first lot of customers, Mr. Croaksby said irritably. He hated distractions. Can you swim? The duckling asked, not seeming to be put off by Mr. Croaksby's tone. Yes, of course I can, Mr. Croaksby said, flexing his webbed feet for the duckling to see. I have webbed feet, same as you, see? The duckling looked sadly at Mr. Croaksby as he continued his work. I can't swim. My brothers and sisters and cousins all laugh at me. I expect you could if you tried, Mr. Croaksby replied. But I have tried. My ma taught me, and my aunt taught me. I'm hopeless. Don't be silly. You're a duck. It comes natural to your sort, just as it does to mine. You aren't hopeless. The duckling looked at him earnestly. But I am, mister. Your ma called me hopeless, so that's my name. The frog looked up from his work. What he saw was a small, in fact tiny, yellow and brown duckling, with a sweet face and black eyes. It looked so meek and slightly sad that Mr. Croaksby decided to do something he would never do for anyone else. I'll teach you, he said. The duckling's eyes widened. Really, sir? Don't sir me, I'm Mr. Croaksby to you and to everyone. Just you come down to the pond this time tomorrow, and I'll teach you until my first customer arrives, see? The duck waddled happily away. The next day, when Hopeless returned, Mr. Croaksby was there, waiting for her. Over the next two weeks, Mr. Croaksby and Hopeless swam and swam and swam in the pond, and the duckling came on in leaps and bounds, and as she learned to swim, she grew, and soon had turned a beautiful chocolate brown colour. In fact, she was quite the most beautiful duck of her mother's children. You know, Mr. Crooksby said one morning, as they swam, I don't think you need swimming lessons any more. You swim quite beautifully. Hopeless turned sad eyes on her friend. No more lessons, but I like them. Mr. Crooksby did not say anything, for he too liked them. Well, Hopeless, if you want to continue the lessons, I won't object, see, he said quietly. 
The duck smiled a duckish smile. And another thing, he continued. I will not be calling you Opalus anymore, he said firmly. You won't? the duck asked, surprised. No, because you aren't Opalus anymore. You're Hope. Hope flapped her wings excitedly. Hope, I like that. <laughs> Chapter 2 Mr. Hootsby and Princess Romy It was Princess Romy's birthday. Mr. Hootsby was the first one to remember it as he flew home from the night's hunting. Good morning, Mr. Hootsby, Reuben the Red Squirrel said as he came out of his home in the hollow of the big tree at the centre of Sundapple Wood. Morning, Reuben, Mr Hootsby said, heading toward his own home. And a very good morning it is, said the squirrel chirpily, too chirpy for this late in the morning. Oh, I was thinking last night, just as I was flying over the palace, that it's little Princess Romy's birthday today. Mr. Hootsby said, stopping just as he was about to go into his own home. Princess Romy's birthday, you say? asked Posy, Reuben's pretty red squirrel of a wife. Yes, Mr. Hootsby said with another big yawn, hurrying into his home and closing the door. We must tell everyone, Reuben said. Just you head on over to the Featherton sisters, his wife advised. It'll be all over some dapple wood by tea time if you do that. This gave her husband a good idea. We should have a party for the princess. A party, said a sweet little voice from above. What's this about a party, Reuben? It was Joy, the little robin redbreast. Joy, Reuben shouted up to the bird. I need you to go to Mr. Croaksby and the others on the other side of the pond and tell them that we're, we're planning a party for Princess Romy. It's her birthday today. Just you hold on a tick, his wife said. She really was a very wise squirrel. What is it? asked her husband. You haven't decided where you're to have the party. It's no good you telling folks about a party when they don't know where to come. It was decided that the large clearing on the other side of the pond would do nicely, and Joy headed off to tell Mr. Croaksby and those animals on the other side of the pond. Reuben headed off to tell the animals on the near side of the pond. The last place on Reuben's journey around the wood was the palace itself, because of course he needed to tell their majesties about the party, or they wouldn't come. A party for my little girl, King Redwin said, poking his little black nose out of his earth home, because you see, the king, queen and Princess Romy were all foxes. Yes, sire, Reuben said. A little squirrely bow. At tea time, eh? King Redwin said. Yes, sire, Reuben said, with another small bow. We'll be there, he said, then vanished from sight to tell his wife of the plan. A large tree stump was to be the buffet table, and by tea time it was laid with lovely things to eat. Cakes and pies and scones and all the nice things there ever were to eat. Posy, Reuben's wife, had laid a beautiful tablecloth over this stump, so that it really did look pretty. The Hopperton brothers came, bringing their fiddles, for they were the best fiddle players in all of Sundapple Wood. Finally, with the trump, trump, trumpeting of the fanfare, the two royal geese came into view, heralding the approach of the royal family. King Redwin was first to enter the clearing, wearing a crown of forget-me-nots. Then Queen Poppy came, wearing a crown of what else? Poppies. And finally, skipping happily after her parents, was young Princess Romy. She had lost her flower crown with too much skipping, but her fur was brushed and shimmering in the setting sun. Happy!
happy birthday, Princess Romy, the animals chorused. Wow, all for me, Princess Romy asked, looking from the tree stump laden with food to the stage where the Hopperton brothers were playing their joyful little fiddle tunes. Happy birthday, darling, Queen Poppy said, embracing her daughter. This is the best birthday I've ever had, Princess Romy said happily. Just as the sun had set, Mr. Hootsby arrived to wish the little princess happy birthday. And to think, Reuben the squirrel said to his wife, that none of this would have happened if owls didn't have very good memories. <laughs> Father Gray's Bad Day. One night, a terrible storm raged through Sundapple Wood. It threw the surface of the pond into scary shapes. It threw the nests of the birds hither and thither. And it bent the big tree almost double, tossing about poor Reuben in his squirrely home. The worst affected by this turn of events was poor Grandfather Gray at the very top of the tree. Grandfather Gray was a big grey squirrel. He was very old, the oldest in the whole wood, and though he was apt to be rather grumpy at times, he was wise and kind and very respected by the residents of the wood. By the time the morning came, Grandfather Gray's home was full of rainwater and his furniture was tossed about and broken and his tail was wet through. Staggering outside, he wrung his tail out, unleashing a torrent of water on poor Joy, who twittered and fluttered in alarm. But Grandfather Grey paid no attention. On the contrary, he fetched his bucket and began bailing water out of his house, right on top of Mr Hootsby, just coming home from a night's hunt. Hoo, hoo, hoo! Mr Hootsby hooted, looking up at up the tree and getting a face full of water for his trouble. What's wrong, Mr. Hootsby? Oh, oh dear, you're all wet, Posy the Red Squirrel said, coming out of her hollow tree home. A very astute observation, my dear, Mr. Hootsby said, fluttering his wings to get rid of the rainwater. Grandfather Gray tipped a whole load of water on my head. He probably didn't mean to, Reuben, Posy's husband said, coming to join her. Why not go up there and ask if he's all right? So the three of them did just that. Grandfather Grey was not pleased to see them. Yes, I did mean to throw that water down the tree. It was in my home. It ruined my best green rug. And just look at what the storm did to my rocking chair. He showed the squirrels and Mr. Hootsby the destroyed little rocking chair. Oh dear, Posy said sadly. Oh dear is right, Grandfather Grey snapped. Now, if you would be kind enough to push off so I can mend this here furniture. I'll be ever so much obliged. He began to push the three visitors out of his door, after which he slammed it in their faces. But he was not to have the peace and quiet he so desired. The big tree, which stood in the exact centre of Sundapple Wood, was a meeting place for all sorts of creatures. The Hopperton brothers loved its hollowed-out holes for music practice. The Featherton sisters came along during the morning to talk to Posy, And around lunchtime, two little boys called Rowley and Spike came along, wanting to have a picnic near the top of the tree. The reason for this was that as Rowley was a sweet little field mouse and Spike was a fat little hedgehog, they did not get very good views stuck on the ground. Reuben the red squirrel lowered his little basket and the two boys happily hopped in, after which they were hauled by the wiry little squirrel to the top of the tree, where the two boys sat and shared their lunch, and talked happily. This upset Grandfather Grey, who, upon the completion of his rocking chair, had lain down to have a midday nap. He was woken by a scream of squeaky laughter from Rolly. Giant mice! Oh, that's a good one, Spike! Who ever heard of giant mice? Eh! Grandfather Grey called down the tree, to where the two boys were sitting. 
You stop that there racket! Frightened, the two boys skipped away. Not long afterward, however, the Hopperton brothers began to fiddle their merry little tunes. Grandfather Grey came hurtling out of his home so fast that he fell down the tree. Thankfully, he did not fall all the way down. He landed splay-legged in Reuben the squirrel's little basket. Oh, Grandfather Grey, Joy the Robin said as she passed and saw this occurrence. You do look funny. Grandfather Grey was in a towering temper. Just you leave me alone, he said, stomping back up the tree. His head was aching now. But as he reached his home, deciding he might just take a nap, he realised that his bed was broken. Growling to himself, he slammed his front door shut so hard that it broke too. The animals down the tree were feeling very sorry for poor Grandfather Grey. We ought to do something to cheer him up, Posey the Red Squirrel said. We could bring him some worms, suggested Spike the Hedgehog, who never turned down food in his life and who loved little crawly worms. I'm not sure Grandfather Grey would like those at all, Mr Hootsby said with a wince. Perhaps a song, asked one of the Hopperton brothers. I think he needs peace and quiet, Joy said eventually. And so for the rest of the day, they kept the tree as peaceful and quiet as possible. As evening approached, Mr. Croaksby the frog came to the tree to visit Grandfather Grey, but he was waylaid at the bottom of the tree by a group of animals. Reuben the squirrel quickly told Mr. Croaksby what had happened. Perhaps, Mr. Hootsby said, getting an idea, for he was a very wise owl, we could use your help, little frog. What if you invited Grandfather Grey to tea? Then while he is out, we can quickly nip into his house and mend all his broken furniture. Posy, you can make him a nice pie, and the Hopton brothers could play him a nice song to help him sleep. This plan was agreed upon, but Grandfather Grey was not easy to coax out of the house. Eventually, though, he descended the tree and set off with Mr. Croaksby. All of the animals quickly rushed up the tree. The Hopperton brothers began mending the bed, while Reuben mended the little door. The little rug was dried and mended and all of the broken crockery was as well. The whole place was clean from top to bottom and a wonderful smell of baking pie wafted from Posy and Reuben's house. Just before dark, Grandfather Grey came up the tree to his home. But what was this? The door was mended. He opened his door. The bed was mended too. The rug was clean and dry and the whole place was clean and fresh. Best of all, a delicious looking pie stood on his table. Surprise! Grandfather Grey turned and found Reuben and Posy, the Hopperton brothers, Rolly Mouse, Spike the Hedgehog, Mr. Hootsby, Mr. Croaksby, and Joy the Robin all behind him. They explained what they had done. They all had a lovely meal together, and when Grandfather Grey fell asleep, he was tucked up in his nice, clean bed and the Harperton brothers played a sweet melody. It's nice to have good friends, sighed Grandfather Grey as he closed his eyes happily. The animals crept from the little hole in the tree. The sky was clear and the moon was bright. Mr Hootsby set off for another night's hunting. Rolly and Spike headed home to their little beds. Joy headed to her nest. The Hopperton brothers headed to their sweet little warrens, and Reuben and Posy headed to their little bed. All was silent in Sundapple Wood, with not a sign of a storm. Mm-hmm.